Good morning, everyone. So good to see you. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome to all of you visiting and sharing and, and tuning in online, Facebook and YouTube and, and the app. We appreciate your presence here as well. As Daniel said, we're going to finish out a series that we've been in the last five weeks. This is week five, and we're going to shut it down after this uh, Sunday, uh, Facing Your Fears. And we've talked about uh, facing your fear of failures, facing the fear of feelings, and, and facing your fear with faith, and facing your fears about finances last week. And today, I'm going to share with you a lesson that I enjoy studying very much, and it meant a lot to me, and I hope it does to you, facing your fears with focus. What that means is you and I are going to try to work today over the next 30 or 40, uh, 90 minutes to see if we can develop the discipline of focus. And I believe the focus is important. We'll get to all of that. Um, you know, Freedom Church exists to reach people to know God. And despite the crisis, despite the craziness of our time, that mission doesn't change, hasn't changed, will never change. The cool thing is we've had several people except Christ trust to put, you know, put their faith in Jesus during this summer and during this, of course, crisis over the last month, even two months. And we're very, very grateful for that. We have over 20, uh, close to 25 people signed up for baptism that's going to happen later in August. We'll tell you all about that as well. So I'm excited that the mission doesn't stop, but it continues. The high five values continue. We're reaching and we're growing together and we're serving and we're connecting and we're giving. Those things are so very, very, very important. All right. And so let's engage today and see what the Lord has for us. I'm going to ask that we uh, stand for a word of prayer and then we'll continue in the word this morning. Good to see you all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are very, very grateful and honored to be in your presence. All praise, honor, and glory are to your holy name. You are the king of all kings, Lord of all lords, the God of all gods, and we honor you in this place today. God, I'm asking, Lord, that you would direct our minds through your Holy Spirit to the word of God, illuminate, turn the lights on, give us understanding. And God, I pray that the resolve within us would grow to a point of relying and trusting and depending on you to see life transformation here today. Give us victory, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all, you may be seated. Today, as I said, we're going to face our fears with focus. Just for the fun of it, here's something I would like you to do. Little corny, little maybe cheesy, all right? But here's what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put your hand out uh, towards me. Let's just say towards me as best you can. You can cover my face or, or go a little bit left or right. But here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like to focus. I'd like you to focus on your hand, all right? Focus on your hand. So what I'm guessing and believing now, because this is the way it is with me, is that your hand isn't clear. It's distinct. It's in focus. However, everything around you and back of me is unclear. Is that correct? Are we good? Now, I'd like you to focus on things around your hand, not your hand. Keep your hand stuck out. Now, don't concentrate on your hand, but everything around your hand. Now, your hand should be just, you know, a little bit out of focus, not clear, uh, and yet everything around you. See that little trick there? It was fun. Worth the price of admission. We'll take an offering at the end. Uh, so um, here's another uh, thing I'd like you to do. Cross your eyes. Man, I forgot my phone. I wanted to bring my phone and get a picture of this. Cross your eyes. For some of you, this is easy. So just look at me with cross eyes, and what happens? You get two of me, right? Two better than one. No one ever said that about me. But you get, you get a double vision, right? And then you let go, and you come back, and it's clear. One last thing about focus. How many of you wear glasses? I see some of y'all. I wear reading glasses. I need glasses to read. I need glasses for the uh, computer, things along that nature. And I can tell you that the level of frustration is very, very high when I don't have any glasses. I got a deal on some glasses the other day. I don't know, where, where was it? Uh, uh, Costco or somewhere like this. I got four pairs, you know. And so I have a pair in my bedroom. I have a pair in my living room, in the great room there. And I have a, a pair in my office. And I have a pair in my uh, uh, car. The idea there is to, wherever you're wearing the glasses, just leave them there when you're done. Leave them there when you're done. Leave them there. I don't know if this ever happens to you, but I still lose them. The other day, I was looking for my glasses and, uh, you know, getting frustrated, as we all do at that point. Uh, come to a, a moment when one of our staff 
reminded me where my glasses were. I had two pairs on me, one hanging from my shirt and one on top of my head, and I couldn't find my glasses. You know, but I could tell you it was frustrating because I needed that focus, and now not only can't I see, but I'm not, I'm kind of stupid too. And so, uh, hey, don't look at me like it's never happened to you. <laughs> That's just the way it is, you know, like Velma on Scooby-Doo, right? When she finds those glasses, man, the world comes alive. And that's what focus does for us. It gives us uh, clarity. So I said we're going to talk about conquering our fears by developing the discipline of focus. And we're going to start by looking at where our focus is, is, is to be concentrated. And it's clearly given to us in Scripture. The scripture today, the text, is Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2, and we're going to read that together. The, the essence or the, 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 the direction of chapter 12 has to do with everything that's happening in chapter 11 of Hebrews. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know that the chapter 11 of Hebrews is what we call the Christian Hall of Fame. And the writer, the author of Hebrews, nobody knows exactly who it may be. Many uh, say it's the Apostle Paul. Many do not say that. Say, and, but the author of chapter 11 suggests all these names and gives us great examples of faith. Men like Abel, men like uh, Noah, and, and Moses, and, uh, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the entire uh, nation of Israel, walked by faith through the Red Sea. You'll see that in chapter 11. You see all kinds of examples. Enoch is an example. Uh, and then it just kind of starts uh, generalizing. You know, they put fires out, talking about Shadrach, uh, or, or Shadrach Meshach, and Abednego. They, they closed the mouth of lions, and so Daniel is mentioned there. And so chapter 11 is a great pool of examples for us, mentors, uh, pace setters, if you will, when it comes to living a life of faith. And that's important going into chapter 12. So chapter 12, and we're just going to cover uh, two verses and go verse, uh, phrase by phrase, but there's only really one phrase I want to concentrate on today. So let's read together Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, everybody say life of faith. Oh, we're talking about focus today, but the bottom line, digging a little bit deeper, really, it's honestly all about the life of faith. So since we're surrounded with such a large crowd, huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. The obvious question at this point would be, what are the weights that slow us down? Well, they could be a hundred different things in our current present day reality of coping with, you know, the tornadoes first, if you remember that, and the, uh, the COVID and the, the economy, the broken economy now expected many jobs, the racial injustice, the riots, the protesting, all of these various things, you know, authority in general, trying to figure it all out. And to top it all off, we have an election in November, you know, and if it's not crazy enough, let me just suggest to you, buckle your seatbelts, friends, November is coming. So the weights that will slow us down in living the life of faith are things like we've been talking about fear, our failures, anxiety, stresses in life. These are the things that, that block us, that slow us down. We have to figure out a way to let them go. You know, what's going on if this happens? Or, or are we going to, or if this happens, if that doesn't, on and on. And the author of Hebrews says simply, listen, strip it off. Let it go. Release it. Lay it, by the, uh, lay it aside because it's slowing us down. The next phrase he says, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Now, of course, uh, we battle our sin nature all the time, and it's not only trips us up, but he says it so easily trips us up, and that's frustrating. And we know and have learned that the same ways to slow us down also trip us up. So let's lay aside the weight that slows us down, let's, let's, especially the sin that trips us up. And then he says, let's run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Once again, we're talking about an objective. The objective is to live this life of faith in a way that's honoring and pleasing to God and a blessing to other people. And there's some barriers, there's some weights, there's some sin that trips us up. He says, let it all go. Let's run this race with, with, with endurance. The message translation uh, puts it this way. Uh, strip down, start running, never quit. In other words, 
Get rid of everything that's slowing you down, bad habits, lack of discipline, lazy living, fears, worries, anxieties, stresses, strip all those, get running, never quit. Friends, that's the challenge for all of us. You and I, that's our calling. Question is this, how do we do it? How do we do that? Hebrews 12, chapter, or verse number two says this, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Now you're starting to get the idea of our focus and where our focus should be directed. We live in a world, friends, of automation, but nothing can automate your mind. And I suggest to you this morning that your mind is the most complex thing on planet Earth. And what I believe the author of Hebrews 12 is talking about is your mindset, your frame of mind, your way of thinking. And so we need to learn to discipline our mind because if we're disciplined in our mind, we are going to be disciplined in our action. So look what John Melton did. I put this in your notes. The notes are in your app. I put this on the screen. I just want you to remember it. Sometimes I make a, a quote some people and I like them so much. I just want you to remember it. So I put it in your app notes. John Melton says something very strong. I think you'll agree, however, the mind is its own place and in itself can make heaven out of hell, a hell out of heaven. And let me tell you one more time, friend, why this is so important. Our country, how we've lost our way. More pronounced because of the struggles of 2020, but listen, don't be fooled, something that started long before this year, and we're in a battle. And we can blame, you know, we can complain, we can defend, we can do all of those things. That the, like I said, the tornadoes or the politicians or the COVID or the riots or the protesters or the, 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 the police brutality and the racism. We can blame all sorts of people and things. But the one thing that we can all agree on is we've about lost our minds in the last several months. And much of this is uncontrollable. I mean, some of the events that was out of our control, but I want to suggest to you that some of it we can control. Some things like this can be controlled, and we must control the controllable. And so I want to work this morning on getting our mind right, and it starts with understanding what we call the mindset cycle. And I want to show you this uh, real quick. It won't be real quick, but I'll show it to you now. How's that? This is the mindset cycle. And this isn't on your notes. It's not on your screens either. But it's something that, this is the part that really helped me. And I would suggest jot this down as best you can. And I want to show you uh, how this works. Our mindset is our mental attitude. It's our set, your set of individual opinions and a particular way of thinking or your frame of mind. It's your mental attitude. This frame of mind, this mindset is created by our experiences, created by our education, maybe in the past, you know, our heritage, our upbringing, things along this nature. This, friends, this is what we're talking about. This mindset cycle is controllable. This is something we can develop, we can massage, we can direct. And I want to submit this uh, to you. If we're going to be effective in running or living the, the life of faith, as he said, if we're going to be effective in living the life of faith, if we're going to be effective in running with endurance the race that is set before us, if we're going to be successful, the first thing we must do is get our minds right. And it begins with our focus. And then there's each step, there's several steps underneath focus. The one creates the other, creates the other, creates the other. And the first one, it all begins with focus. What is focus? Well, we illustrated it a little earlier, but focus is simply uh, what you pay attention to, isn't it? Your focus is what you're concentrated on. It's what you think about. Focus comes when you zero in. Focus comes when you double down. When you squint your eyes and you really work at it, I mean, you're, you're laser focused. And, 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 and HuffPost had an article uh, on this topic, and here's some of what they said is very important. Focus is so important because it is the gateway to all thinking. Focus is the gateway to all thinking. Perception, memory, learning, reasoning, problem solving, decision making. Without good focus, all aspects of your ability to think will suffer. I think that's true. 
Years ago, when I was a boy, my father uh, taught me how to play baseball. He taught me how to throw. He taught me, more importantly, how to hit. That was my favorite position, the batter's box, you know. And so here's what he would say to me. He taught me first how to swing the bat, you know, nice level swing. I was a lefty, which is better. And so um, we, he taught me how to swing the bat. And then what he did was he said this. If he said it once, he said it a hundred times. Keep your eye on the ball. You know, and he was my coach, and so he'd pitch to me, and I was just a young lad, about eight years old, actually, and we started him at three years old these days, but I had to wait till I was eight, and so we were playing ball, and so I took things literally, so I did what he said. I kept my eye on the ball, and the ball would come in, and I had no other focus whatsoever. Nothing got my attention for 60 feet or whatever it was back in the you know, Little League days uh, of that distance, only that ball. There was a lot of things happening around me, you know, all the fielders and, and the birds and the weather and all these things, but I had one concentration because my father taught me, if you want to be successful in this task of hitting the baseball, you must keep your eye on the ball. And I grew up to be a good hitter. And I grew up to be able to hit the fastball and the curveball and the knuckleball. It didn't matter. Why didn't it matter? <laughs> because I had my eye on the ball. And if it moves left and moves right, you know, I'm ready. If it does weird things, we know with the knuckleball, I was ready because I kept my eye on the ball. If we're going to live the life of faith, if we're going to be successful in running the race with endurance that we've been called to, we have to keep our focus. And that's very, very important. Listen. A friend of mine, Sean Castorina, he's a serial entrepreneur, and uh, we talk very, very often. He, he writes a lot of books, and he said this about focus. I thought it was very good. The ability to focus and stay on one high-level task, project, or goal is what successful people do that unsuccessful people fail to do. I thought that was important because I looked at that. That not only speaks to the value of focusing, but the challenge of focusing, not only for business interests, but for the successes in all areas of life. And so we're learning about the definition of focus. We're understanding the value of focus, the power of focus. And I'm suggesting to you that we, when, when we begin this mindset, developing and disciplining the mindset cycle, it begins with this, focus. Now, Here's something interesting. Whatever you focus on will feed and create the next thing, which is our self-talk. Our focus leads to that second stage called self-talk. Our, our focus actually creates it. Let me share with you this. I heard a little bit by Betty Davis. You may have heard this where she was interviewed and the interview asked her a question and she said, first question, how many people live at this residence? And Betty said, zero. And, and the interviewer said, well, Betty, don't you live at this residence? And she said, oh, including me, three. And <laughs> that's just Betty, you know, and that's actually funny. No, I thought it was funny. <laughs> She was listening to the voices in her head, and don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. And we, we all have these, uh, this self-talk. We battle the voices. I read a, an interesting uh, a, a statistic about self-talk. Research suggests that you and I have 50,000 thoughts that run through our mind every single day. And I thought that was a little high. I read another piece of research that said 70,000. Friends, listen, if it was 25,000, it'd be like 25,000 too many for me. And so self-talk, 50,000 thoughts that go through our mind every single day. You know what research also says? What do you guess the percentage was of negative self-talk? 80 80% of self-talk is negative? That's crazy to me. And I started thinking about my self-talk. I think, it, I think it, it's true. Example would be anything. I mean, example, uh, 50,000 is a lot. Let's talk about, well, let me just give you how it works in my head. I'm preaching today. You know, the self-talk is, well, you know, why would you be speaking today? I mean, you don't have anything to say. This is the rhetoric that we, I talk to myself about, you know. You're boring anyway. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear from you. And on and on and on and on it goes. And those are the, that's the self-talk that you and I, you know, we deal with. Now, our calling 
is to live the life of faith, right? Our calling is to walk with patience, live or run the race with patience. And so we have a calling, we have a task. And so the self-talk may be strong, but we have to develop this mindset so we can get victory. And so we're talking about self-talk, we're talking about focus and focus creating uh, self-talk. The point is what we focus on creates that self-talk. And so we really need to consider where our focus is. By the way, before we leave this point, let me just tell you the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, taking every thought captive, which to me means that you and I, we accept responsibility for what we're thinking. You see, friends, you do have the ability to exercise control over your thoughts. How is that? Well, you, you begin by realizing that you can think through your issues and problems rather than just reacting to them. You and I, we have the ability to deal with the thoughts uh, born of worry and fear and doubt and even lust. And that's what taking every thought captive means. And it's a really, uh, it's, it's a very real phase or stage here. Our focus, whatever it is that we give our attention to and concentration will feed that and create the self-talk. And I want to say again, this is controllable. Our self-talk then goes to our next phase, which is our feelings. And when I say feelings, I mean uh, your beliefs, your, your emotions, how you're feeling about what just, you know, happened. You're focused on creating your self-thought. And because of this, I have, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not the one to be here today. Maybe I can't speak uh, with, with any thing to, interesting to help people with, and, and you start agreeing with it, you know, and these are your beliefs, these are your, your emotions, and their feelings, again, created by self-talk. So we focus, creates our self-talk, creates our feelings, our emotions, our beliefs, and we start believing the voices. We don't have to, we start believing, and these feelings are important because feelings come, uh, feelings from our feelings come then our actions. Your behavior or your action then feeds and creates that focus again. That's the mindset cycle. What I'm saying is feeding uh, feelings, emotions, belief, they feed the actions. Well, the actions feed your focus, and here we go. You know, that circle, that cycle, that, that thing that we need to come to grips with and work on and develop this discipline of, of focus. So it's so important that we get this. There are many Bible characters that show this mindset cycle, including the stories of Noah and Joseph and Moses, especially Elijah, King David, and also Peter. And if you have time, we'll get to Peter here uh, and, and talk a little bit about him. But this is important. You and I, we have the, the ability to discipline this mindset cycle, to discipline it in a positive, in a life-giving, God-honoring way. So... Just let me add some clarity, all right? Let's reverse engineer this. We go top to bottom, let's reverse engineer. If I want my actions to be better, then I have to work on the way I feel, my emotions and belief. If I want to feel better, I have to discern the self-talk and work on that. If I want my self-talk to be better and proper, I need to think about what it is I'm focusing on focusing on. And so uh, the physics would be if the actions align, with, the actions will align with your feelings. Your feelings will align with your self-talk and your self-talk will align with your focus. I think it's pretty simple. I think we get it. All right. It goes down, it goes up, it goes circular. It's just a kind of a, it could be a vicious cycle, but it could be okay. It could be a good thing as we discipline and think about what it is that we have the opportunity to do. Now, let's Keep, take our minds off of that for just a moment. Let's go back to the Bible. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number two. Here's what the, the author says. Once again, keep your eyes on Jesus. The author here suggests that the key to living the life of faith is to keep your eyes on Jesus. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, based on the authority of Scripture, God is calling you, God is calling me to focus on him. Focus on him. In fact, there are other places in scripture where he does the same thing. Colossians chapter three and verse two. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. This has to do with your focus. Think about the things in heaven, not the things of earth. Matthew 6, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Seek God's kingdom. 
And then 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, having to do with, again, your concentration, your focus, who you're looking to. Hebrews 3, verse 1, fasten your thoughts fully unto Jesus. And then Isaiah 26, verse 3 is a great verse. You will keep him in perfect peace, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And so as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to set our minds on things above. Actually, in, in, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul gives us a list of things. This is what I want you to think about. If it's good, if it's lovely, if, if it's encouraging, edifying, all of these positive, it, then think on those things. The point is, as believers in Jesus, we have the opportunity to discipline our minds in a positive way. As followers of Christ, we have God's power backing us as we create the proper mental attitude. And so, God is calling you and I to focus on him. Let me ask you, what is your focus on these days, you know? Uh, like, what do you think about when you're driving home through traffic? What do you think about when you're laying down at night before falling asleep? Where are your thoughts? What has your attention? I want you to take a moment and think about how you would answer these types of questions. But know this, the answer to this question has everything to do with you gaining victory over the stresses, the anxieties, and the fears of our time. And that's something we want and we desire, but I'm suggesting we have to uh, put something into action here. We have to think about our focus and turn to Jesus. What are the practical steps that we need to take that will help us keep our eyes on Jesus? There's five great ways to do this. I want to challenge you. Uh, this is the outline. This is in your notes and on your screen. Number one is this. Here's, what, here's how you focus on Jesus. And this is something that uh, uh, India uh, did so well with a couple weeks ago. Surrender. Surrender. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Praise, glory, and honor to your holy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not mine, not my agenda, not my purposes, not my ideas, not my timeline or schedule. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Your purposes be accomplished, dear God. Your agenda is first. And, and, and I have to cognitively surrender my will to the will of Jesus. I have to make Jesus Savior, obviously. I need Jesus to be Lord, Master over all areas of my life. We're suge I'm suggesting to you, run the race with patience. Uh, live the life of faith. Do this as your mentors did it, those who have set the example in chapter 11. Focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Surrender every day. And this is what I do, honestly, every day. I, uh, when I wake up, I begin with prayer. I begin with Bible reading. I begin with the Lord's Prayer, and I surrender. Paul said, the Apostle Paul, who's better uh, than I am, uh, more credibility, right? Listen to what Paul said, I die daily. And what he was suggesting is the same thing. I just surrender my will. I, I focus on Jesus. And that's how I start my day. That's how I set the pace. And surrendering our will to God's will shifts our focus, as I said, from our way of thinking to God's way of thinking. And living that kind of life will make what Psalm 1 says make you happy or make you blessed. Living that kind of life removes fear. Living that kind of life reduces, removes stresses of life, anxieties. Living that kind of life, problems and challenges, you know, are still around. They, they don't go away. But living a surrendered life that blocks the anxiety and blocks the stress because you're focused on Jesus as the source of your strength. I challenge you, wake up in the morning, tomorrow, Monday morning, right in the middle of this worldwide pandemic among all the other things surrounding it, and surrender your will and say, dear Lord Jesus, be honored and glorified and pleased in my life this day. I surrender. Here's the second thing. The way to keep your focus on Jesus. Identify and eliminate 
distractions. And this goes along with what verse 1 says. Get rid of this weight. It trips us up. Uh, it, it weighs us down. It slows us down. Get rid of all of these. And there's a hundred things. I mean, you, you, you can consider, you, you, all of us know our distractions. You know what it is that does slow you down or weighs you down and steals your time. And it could be a hundred different things. I'll just pick on one real quick because it's so easy. Social media. And you're like, dang, it's right before dinner. I'm just going to check this one thing out real quick. Five minutes, 90 minutes later, you lost that 90 minutes of sleep, right? But I'm just suggesting, and it's a distraction. And if we're going to focus, if we're going to control the controllables, if we're going to take and, and look at Jesus and not our own agenda, then we have to consider what is it presently that is hindering that part? What is it in my life that is actually a distraction? Here's number three. Number one, surrender. Number two, identify and eliminate distractions. Number three, worship. When I say worship, I'm going to group uh, singing, prayer, Bible reading, all as one. We worship and honor God. That's the beauty, I think, of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're blessed be your name. Honored, glorified your name. And we spend time with the Lord. Listen, look, look at this verse talking about the scripture, Psalm 19, verse 10. God's word is better than a diamond, better than a diamond set between emeralds. <clears throat> I'm thinking, this is cool. God's word is. I mean, it's valuable. It's pure. It's powerful. It's exciting. He says, you like it better than strawberries in spring, better than red, ripe strawberries. <clears throat> now, for me, I'm like, nope. I don't like strawberries. This verse doesn't work. Thankfully, if you go to Psalms, and specifically Psalm 119, you have over 100 verses talking about how beautiful the Word of God is. But some of you I know, you love those strawberries. And you're suggesting to me that God's Word is better and more valuable and precious than, than strawberries? You know, absolutely. That's what he says. Think about the beauty of being with Jesus in a quiet time, reading His Word listening as you pray, listening as you share your doubts and fears, listening as you share your ideas, because you should be sharing all of those things. I mean, he's, he's big enough for all of them. And, you, and, and, and the Bible says, as you connect with him, he that abides in me and I in him. You know, John chapter 15, uh, you'll see this great connection of intimacy develop because of your walk with the Lord in worship whether it be singing or praying or reading the, the, the Word of God. Some of you are facing some strong battles. I mean, and they're far more intimidating and daunting than, than I could ever uh, understand or realize. Some of you, the struggles are financial, some health-related, some relational, some, you know, your uh, occupation or whatever it is in your life. They're real battles. They're real battles. And when I think of worship, my mind always goes back to this amazing, powerful story in, in the Old Testament. Uh, it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And you may, if you read the Bible through, you may remember this. It's, there's a lot of crazy stories in the Bible. This one's really cool and somewhat crazy. Uh, and I'll just share with you what this is. In, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, there was a king uh, that, that was taking his army to battle. The king of Judah, his name was Jehoshaphat. And... And he was outnumbered, he was outpowered, he was out of options. And so what does he do? The Bible says he falls flat on his face and he, before God and he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12, we do not know what to do. I'm really good at that too. I'm really, most of the time, I just don't know what to do, God, you know. And then he says, but our eyes on you. That's another thing that sometimes I screw up. He says, but our eyes are upon you, and I find myself saying, well, no, I want to fix it. I want to be in charge. I want to do it on my own. But the example here is saying, no, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to have to release this. I'm going to have to give it to God. So instead of mustering the military and convening the joints of staff, King Jehoshaphat does something that's very, very extraordinary. He creates and forms the praise team, praise band, singers. <clears throat> and he suggests to these singers, you all are going to lead us in this fight, in this battle. And there were questions. And we're like, what do you mean, like lead us, right? We're going to play or something before? 
No, you're going to lead us, and we're going to march, and you're going to physically be at the front of the line. And at this point, I'm like, yeah, get them out there. You know? But then I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on here? God is directing King Jehoshaphat to fight his battles with praise. You know, Daniel talks about this all the time. You know, this is a, is a warfare, and, and praise is, a, is your best tool against the enemy. We're talking about the mindset. We're talking about, what are we talking about? Keeping our eyes on Jesus, right? We're going to surrender. We're going to get rid of the distractions, and we're going to come to a quiet place and honor God with our praise. We're going to fight our battles with praise. If you read the story there, you'll see that the enemies of King Jehoshaphat, they up and ran. They up and ran, and they were defeated. God's people won once again. It was just a cool example of the power of praise. And that's what I'm suggesting. Number one, surrender. Number two, identify and eliminate distractions. Number three, worship. And then number four, uh, create the mindset. And once again, I just want to say this. The, these things here, they're controllable. We can create them. We don't have to become a victim of our self-talk. We get to choose what the thoughts are all about. We can deflect the negative ones. We can begin to speak into our lives the scripture. Let me give you an example. You take a, the scripture and uh, Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So I'm going to focus on that truth. And my self-talk will be related to my focus. My focus is going to create my self-talk. So the self-talk, when I focus on I can he says, I can. This is God's word. This is inspired, authoritative, credible. Everything that we believe and the way we behave is based upon the teachings and writings of the scripture. And so if that's true, then I, I can do this. You know what I'm going to do? I am going to do this because I believe that I can because God says I can because I'm focusing on God. I can do all, do all things through Christ. So I can and I will. I feel. And then your actions. So again, suggesting that we can create our mindset. It's just one of those things that's going to help us capture this focus and keeping our eyes on Jesus. Number five, repeat the process daily. Surrender. Get rid of the distractions. Worship. Create that mindset. And do it again on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. It becomes a rhythm, becomes a way of life because of love, because of desire, because of fat passion for the Lord. I added uh, another one, bonus, a bonus action point. So it's not number six, it's just bonus, all right? Here's what it is. Maybe the most important after surrender Ask a friend to do these five things with you. Ask a friend to do these five things with you. You're going to catapult. You're going to increase the percentage of victory, of possible, no potential victory. It's going to be sweeter because Proverbs 17, verse 27 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens his friend. Here's what I'm suggesting. This is kind of a nutshell here. Focus changes everything. One man said this, energy flows where the attention goes. Think about that. Energy flows where the attention goes. George Lucas, author or creator of Star Wars, always remember your focus determines your reality. Zig Ziglar said, I don't know or I don't care how much power, brilliance, or energy you have. If you don't harness it and focus it on a specific target and hold it there, you're never going to accomplish as much as your talent warrants. One quick example, one Bible verse and we'll be done. You remember when Peter was walking on the water? This past week in our small group, we started talking about favorite miracles. And uh, there was a lot of them, you know, all kinds of incredible miracles in the Bible. I like to meditate. Sometimes when I'm lying down and I can't fall asleep, I start thinking about how many miracles in my head can I name and start rehearsing them. That's so cool and fun. You know, one girl said that her favorite was when Jesus turned the water into wine. I have no idea why she said that, uh, but that's her favorite, right? And so mine actually is when Peter walked on water. It just blows my mind how, I mean, I try to picture myself actually doing that, you know? And so here's my thinking. 
The Bible says that when Peter got out of the boat and went to Jesus, he was focused on Jesus. And as long as he was focused on Jesus, he was successful. Good things were happening. But I want to I suggest, that, and I just want to play with these words a little bit. He had peace, we understand. I mean, he wasn't concentrated on the boisterous wind, as the scripture says. The, the storm was crazy. But he wasn't focused on the storm. The stress was high. The anxiety was real, but he wasn't focused on the stress or anxiety. He was focused on Jesus. And he was winning. He was progressing. He was doing good. He was, listen to this, invigorated. He was exhilarated. Peter walking on the water to Jesus was fully alive. Secure, trusting, courageous. The storm was whipping. And he was still secure, trusting, and courageous because he had his eyes focused on Jesus. When his eyes went away from Jesus, it got chaotic. He got scared. He got fearful. He felt he was going to die. I mean, I would have. He was without hope. He was losing. He was going down, focused on Jesus. He's saved. Listen, when I'm focusing on Jesus, I'm walking in the Spirit. And I'm feeding the Spirit. When I'm focused on other things and not focused on Jesus, I'm walking in the flesh. I'm feeding the flesh. And this is another reason why need, we need a friend to do life together with. So I'm ending today with uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2. Let me just say, verse number 1, Romans 12. Romans, the book of Romans is amazing. Chapter 12 says, I beg you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Give it all to God. It's your reasonable service, you know. God is so good. And then verse number two uh, talks about, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. He says, don't copy the behavior or the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. I mean, we talked a lot about focus today. We've talked a lot about uh, where our focus to be. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Some of you are here today, or some of you are watching online, and let me just suggest to you, no joke, you have lost your minds. The heaviness of the last several months is real. But so more real is reality where Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd, and because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Today would be a great day for you to turn your eyes back on Jesus, to re recommit your body, mind, and soul back to Jesus today. Stop allowing fear, anxiety, and stress. Dominate your, your mind. Reframe your thoughts. Take control of your self-talk. Reclaim your emotions, your beliefs. Live in such a way that he will find acceptable, and you will find life exhilarating. And the peace of God will pass everything in your life. It's amazing. Would you bow your heads with me, please? With your heads bowed and eyes closed as we go to prayer. Let me just challenge you again. Get rid of the weight. The sin trips us up. How do we do this? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, you know, over the last several months, I must admit, I've gotten off track. I've gotten my minds off of Jesus. But today, I understand the need I understand the value. I understand that God wants to do a special work in me and through me to be a blessing to others as well. That I don't have to live in fear. That I don't have to live with this uh, overwhelming sense of stress and anxiety. That I can release it. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to refocus. I'm going to look to Jesus. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Would you slip your hand up? I'm going to pray in just a moment. See, that's me. That's where I'm at. That's what I desire. 
Keep your hands raised for just a moment. Many hands. God bless each of you. God bless, bless each of you. Listen, let's stand together and let's pray right now. Dear Lord Jesus, you know our hearts, you know our minds, and I pray, Lord, in your name that you would minister to our deepest needs today. Call us, Lord. Compel us. How can we not come back to focus and keeping our eyes on Jesus? And I pray today for those who, who acknowledge and desire prayer, Lord, that you would bless them in a special way and, and cause, Lord, that we take these steps, each one of them, that would help us to clarify and regain our strength and confidence in you and in life. So bless them, I do pray. Listen, folks, maybe you're here today and you do not know uh, Christ as your Savior. You know, when, when Peter was going down because he took his eyes off of Jesus, he lost hope, and that's what happens when we get our eyes off of Jesus. Some of you may have never put your eyes on Jesus, or I would say some of you would never come to a point in your life where you decided, you know, I'm going to trust that God knows better than I do. I'm going to trust that God is who he said he is. I'm going to trust that Jesus loved me enough to give his life for me. And I'm today, by faith, here in this auditorium or at home online, wherever you may be, I'm gonna say yes to Jesus. I'm gonna turn my entire life over to him, receive this beautiful forgiveness of sins, this life of faith, and the peace that Jesus gives. Listen, if that's your need today, in the quietness of this moment, right where you stand or right where you sit, right wherever you are, just pray and say, Dear Lord Jesus, today is the day I need you in my life. Please forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from all of that. Today I trust in you. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. The greatest decision you can make, the most important relationship you have, Jesus as Savior. And Lord, as we continue and we get ready to close our service, I pray that you would be honored for those, Lord, who may have exercised faith in that very moment, that you would bless, encourage, support, strengthen, give them confidence that says, I am a child of God. I am forgiven, and my life is in Jesus. Bless all of those. Dear God, I pray in the wonderful name of Christ, amen.